Hello. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone in the room. And I understand we've got at least 20 that have logged on online as well to join this evening session in Kyoto. So I know it's been a long day for many people. Um, and we appreciate you taking the time and joining us in this session. We are going to be exploring uh, different models of industry engagement and regulation to tackle online child sexual abuse and exploitation. My name is Afruz Kaviani. I work for UNICEF headquarters in New York as the global lead on child online protection. I'm joined by my colleague, um, Josie, um, who leads our work on child rights and responsible business conduct in the digital environment. So Josie is managing our online moderation today and she'll be looking out for questions and comments that may be coming from our online participants. And we're delighted to have with us um, expert speakers from different sectors and really from around the globe joining us representing Australia's eSafety Commissioner, uh, Japan's Children and Families Agency, Japan's private sector, Ghana's Cybersecurity Authority and BSR, Business for Social Responsibility. Um, our aim today is to foster collaboration and the exchange of ideas, um, experiences and innovative strategies on this difficult topic of child sexual abuse online. So I do want to give the content warning that we are speaking about a difficult topic and it, it may be disturbing for people in the room or online. So please feel free to step out or do what you need to do um, to um, you know, safeguard your, your own well-being. Um, many of you already know uh, that this challenge of child exploitation on the internet is not new. Um, however, its nature has changed over the last decades. Um, and in the early stages, efforts primarily were looking at halting the spread of child sexual abuse materials on the internet. But today we're seeing how technology is also being used to enable or facilitate child sexual abuse in a wide range of ways, including the live streaming of child sexual abuse, the grooming of children for sexual abuse, um, the coercion, deception, and pressuring of children into creating and sharing explicit images of themselves. So obviously it goes without saying that addressing this issue requires collaboration across sectors and it requires strengthening of systems for protection uh, for children, you know, in their homes, in their communities and in, 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 in their countries. But today we're zooming in on a specific dimension of this response and it's about how different jurisdictions are engaging companies in this effort. And we've got one round of questions uh, for our panelists and then we're going to open the floor for questions and discussions from the audience. So I'm really delighted to um, turn to Australia to start us off and we're so pleased to have with us uh, Julie and Mum Grant who is Australia's eSafety Commissioner. Uh, thank you Commissioner for joining us and the question for you is really um, being the world's pioneering um, government agency for online safety. I'm interested to hear from you about the suite of regulatory tools that you're deploying to really drive systemic change um, in industry against online child abuse. It's important to start with the fact that um, Australia has had s a strong online content scheme for more than 22 years, which means almost none of the content, illegal content that we're dealing with online is hosted in Australia. It's almost all extraterritorial and overseas. Um, so you see the world moving towards some um, much more process and systemic types of laws. We're seeing with the online safety bill in the UK, with the Digital Services Act. We do have process and safety uh, powers, but I, I also want to start by talking a little bit about the complaint schemes that we have, because I believe it's one of the most important things that we do. We seem to forget that 
it's individuals who are being abused online, and that's how um, harm manifests. And the ability to take down that content to prevent the re-traumatization, um, but also to understand the trends that are happening through engaging with the public is really critical to our success in applying the systems and process powers. So, just to give you an example, um, we've had we've seen a doubling this year of child sexual exploitation when we. Um, analyzed about 1,300 URLs, we found that one in eight is now, instead of interfamilial abuse, which tends to be more typical, one in eight is coerced and self-produced um, through um, smartphones and webcams in children's bedrooms and bathrooms in the safety of the family home. So that's really significant. It just shows that the internet is becoming a new receptacle um, for targets, for predators, and it's no longer um, uh, one of, uh, of convenience. The other huge trend that a number of us are seeing is we've had a tripling of sexual extortion reports um, coming into our image-based abuse schemes. So image-based abuse, and the non-consensual sharing of intimate images and videos, we are seeing younger um, chil you know, children um, being subject to that, but it's now young men between the ages of 14 and 24 that are largely being targeted. And while 18 is the year that um, you know we consider um, young people adults, they still don't, they're not totally cognitively developed. They may be leaving school, so they don't have the um, pastoral care and protections that they might once, once have had. So it's a very distressing kind of crime, and sometimes it can happen very rapidly. Um, you know, organized criminals have figured out that young men will take off their clothes and perform sexual acts for the camera more readily than um, young women. And um, they will, you know, they will negotiate down. We've had, we've seen some negotiations where they'll, they'll try and extract $15,000 from a, a teenager. And they'll say, well, I'm just a teenager. I don't have that money. Well, how much can you give me? And it's relentless. Um, but they'll also use um, guilt and shame and other tools of social engineering. So all of this is really important for us to understand. Um, we've actually developed um, some intelligence reports for companies like Snap and Instagram to say this is how we see your platform being weaponized. If, y if you use some AL and machine learning, you can see that these same images are being used in a thousand different uh, reports and, and if you use some natural language processing, you'll see that they're using the same language. So we need to encourage the companies to step up, and that's where safety by design is a key systemic tool. But I guess the most po potent one that we have is what we call the basic online safety expectations, and that's where uh, we lay out a set of um, foundational expectations we have for uh, online companies, whether they're gaming or dating sites or social media sites or messaging sites, to operate in our country. and. It gives us the oppor uh, uh, opportunity to ask transparency questions and compel legal answers. Questions we've been asking for six years, basic things like photo DNA has been used for more than 10 years. Which services are you using it on? Are you using it at all? Are you looking at traffic indicators for live stream child sexual abuse material? Um, again, um, we can find the companies based on whether or not they respond truthfully and fulsomely in the manner and form. So that's where the, the, the penalties are. Um, we put out a, a pretty stunning report, I think, in December of, of 2006, looking at the most powerful com countries and companies in the world that have the financial resources and the capability um, to do things, but um, we're not doing enough. Um, so shining that light with sunlight being the best disinfectant um, is, I think, an effective tool we've already seen in the United States, the Heaton Initiative and others, you know, putting pressure on companies like, like Apple um, to target child sexual abuse material. Um, you can't tell me that in 2022, they only had 234 cases of child sexual abuse when they've got more than a billion handsets and iPads in, in the market on, and iCloud and iMessage. So we, we, we really need to, to lift the hood. We'll be um, making um, a similar set of enforcement announcements next year, focused on five more countries. So um, we need to continue to work together. We need to lift the lid. We need to focus sunlight on so that we don't let um, darkness fester um, in the darkest recesses of the web.
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, that is so fascinating, just the breadth of tools and really um, I have to apologise and let everyone in the room know that I've given a very small amount of time <laughs> to each speaker. So um, the Commissioner did an amazing job there, really covering the breadth, but I think we're going to have time to unpack and understand better. But I think um, just what you've managed to do and just those analogies of, you know, shining the light and using those regular regulatory tools um, to lift I the I forgot hood. just to mention that we oh. have um, – <laughs> codes, um, mandatory codes and standards covering eight sectors of the um, technology ecosystem, five of which we've um, filed uh, a search engine code which now includes generative AI um, and synthetic um, generation of CSAM and TVEC, um, but uh, we're creating standards for a broader range of um, what we call designated internet services and um, relevant to electronic services. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we're now going to move to Japan. Um, we're here in Japan, so it's, it's, it's very um, timely and it's actually very exciting to introduce the next speaker, uh, Mr. Tatsuya Suzuki. He's the director of a newly formed agency in Japan, which is, you know, very significant for the child protection and child rights architecture in this country. So he's the director of the Child Safety Division of the Children and Families Agency. He'll be joining us uh, online. And the question for Mr. Suzuki is to understand with his ex extensive experience, which includes roles at Japan's National Police Agency, we're wanting to know more about how this newly formed agency is really going to push forward public-private initiatives in order to tackle the specific issue of online child sexual abuse and exploitation. で、今ご紹介いただきました。え、ま、ご紹介いただきました。え、ま、ご紹介いただきました。え、ま、ご紹介いただきました。え、ま、ご紹介いただきました。え、ま、ご紹介いただきました。え、ま、ご紹介いただ
人が世界に向け、多様な表現活動を行うことができるインターネットの特性に配慮し、民間における自主的かつ主体的な取り組みが大きな役割を担います。国および地方政府はこれを尊重することを旨とするというふうになっております。えー、そしてこの法律に基づき定められている基本計画では、インターネットの利用を通じて子どもが児童ポルノなど、性的搾取等の被害やトラブルに遭う事例が絶えないことなどに考え、関係省庁や関係事業者としてと連携して、子どもやその保護者に対して、インターネットの適切な利用に関する広報・啓発等の対策を総合的に推進しています。えー、この仕事はですねあの、以前から内閣府、キャビネットオフィスで取り組んできたわけですけれども、えー、今年の4月に子ども家庭庁ができましたので、えー、一時引き取って、えー、取り組んでいるという形であります。官民の連携ということについて少しご説明いたしますと、先ほどお話ししましたとおり、青少年インターネット環境整備法では、民間における自主的かつ主体的な取り組みを尊重することとしておりまして、政府としても民間団体や組織と連携して取り組みを進めています。えー、子どもが安全に安心してインターネットを利用できる環境の整備に向けて、えー、学者や弁護士、えー、通信事業者の団体、学校の関係者、PTA の団体と、えー、こういった各方面の専門家の方々と、えー、検討会、えー、青少年インターネット環境の整備等に関する検討会というものを開催しまして、基本計画の見直しに向けた議論を行うなどしています。最後に、えー、子ども性被害の防止対策について少し、えー、説明しますと、えー、従来、警察庁、ナショナルポリスエージェンシーが、えー、子どもの性的搾取等に関する日本政府の取り組み、これの取りまとめをしておりました。えー、昨年にはこの、えー、性被害防止プラン、えー、2022ができましたけれども、えー今年からは子ども家庭庁の取りまとめを担当しております。えー、取り組みの推進にあたっては、えー、公益財団法人、日本ユニセフ協会様にも、公職員としてご参加いただいている官民の協議会を開催するなどして、官民一体となった総合的な活動をすることとしております。えー、私からは、えー、簡単ですが、以上、説明していただきました。よろしくお願いします。Thank you so much,、um, Mr. Suzuki. It's so fascinating. This is very fresh. It's very new, and I really wish you all the best、uh, with the e n d e a v o r And I think there, there may be also questions from the floor when we come to the, to the questions and answers. But fantastic to hear how there is you know, the, these basic standards in the law, and now you are starting the implementation measures, which are taking that multi sectoral approach, but with a strong engagement of the private sector. Um, on that note, I'm very pleased to、um, shift the mic to the private sector representative from、uh, Japan,、uh, Mr. Toshiaki Tateishi, who is representing the Japan Internet Provider Association as well as the Internet Content Safety Association. And my question is、um, if you can let us know how private sector initiatives in Japan have adapted over the last decade、yes. to address emerging challenges relating to online child sexual abuse and exploitation.、Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, uh, um, I'm very happy to be here. So I'd like to ask,、uh, explain some Japanese situation. So could you check?、Yeah. <coughs> so、uh, the In Japan, we have、uh, the secrecy of communication.、Uh, it's a constitutional、uh, law or something. And,、uh, so, but the blocking system is very hard to the ordinary people. How do they work? In? Then I make a small <laughs>、uh, uh, slice. So, could you put、uh, something? Okay. So, this is uh, uh, ordinary people think like that. So, we are going. 
go outside then uh, then uh, I went went to I want to go somewhere uh the house or any other building so then you <coughs> we cannot uh we found we cannot uh, go enter the then <coughs> Uh, but this is not a blocking. Uh, this is just a, a real wild block. So could you? So I'm sorry, uh, a little bit uh, still Japanese. So this is a normal website uh, access with DNS. Uh, could you put some? Yes, yeah, so we uh, ask the uh, we put uh, some URL. Then the DNS uh, will <coughs> reply your. Uh, query so put someone uh, one more so the little uh, uh, reply some IP addresses then we can get to the servers so put, put it then the the web pages appeared so next please so but the broken system is like this the DNS server uh, answered the uh, wrong uh, kind of uh, another <coughs> uh, server's IP address. Then uh, we uh, put a uh, next, please. So uh, we cannot uh, access to the uh, server. <coughs> then, but uh, as like this, so many people think about that. Uh, the I first mentioned, uh, like uh, uh, ordinary uh, road uh, to enter some um, buildings. I uh, think that, but uh, actually the uh, the <coughs> blocking system is working uh, this uh, red circle. Uh, next, please. So it's like this. We, we have always gatekeeper each uh, house. Uh, uh, please. So when I want to go to the karaoke, uh, the gatekeeper will say, okay, push it. Next, please. Then one more push, please. You can go there. So, but uh, uh, next, please. yes. But uh, in fact, uh, the blocking systems like this. That uh, next, please. S he said, to, "I want to go to the house A." Then the gatekeeper no. Then you cannot <coughs> go out, uh, even in your uh, from your house. So this is a blocking system. But uh, so. Um, any other kind, uh, in can say it's other um, view. So, if we broke them uh, in Japan, but many other countries uh, can access the um, each uh, whatever uh, access the uh, content. So, only Japanese don't know. <laughs> uh, next, please. So this is a blocking sys uh, scheme as a measure against uh, uh, these sites. Uh, so many uh, and left side of this slide, uh, uh, the users of the internet uh, report uh, which you always uh, have illegal content something. Then they will uh, the report is coming from. Then the, our association, Internet Content Safety Association, uh, we make it uh, a list and. Uh, automatically, uh, the DNS server retrieves the list and uh, uh, weekly, then update the DNS so uh, we can block the uh, illegal contents. The so next please. Next please. So, but look at it, if the website is located in Japan, uh, deleted by the USB, uh, ISP, and put it again, please. So, and the police will have an investigation about that. Uh, push please. So arrest the criminals, but not in located in Japan, located overseas, please. Uh, uh, check the uh, site, which is uh, rarely existed or not. Then we have a validation about that, which is a sexual abuse something. And uh, then after that, we create a list and we distribute a, a list to the ISP. And uh, uh, then the sites are blocked. After that, but we check weekly, which is exists on node. Then uh, sometime we delete the uh, URL from the list. Thank you very much. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, one more express. 
So in 2016, the, the uh, UN rep uh, rep report about uh, uh, freedom of expression in Japan, I, <coughs> I was talking with him. Uh, he said uh, 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 this is a model, a kind of, uh, uh, how can I say, a uh, uh, great model in Japan presents in the area of freedom of ex internet, he said. Uh, the very low level of government interference uh, with digital freedoms addresses the government's commitment to freedom of expression. As the government uh, considers the legislation related to the uh, wiretaps and new approaches to cybersecurity, I hope that uh, this uh, spirit of freedom, communication, security, and innovation online is kept as a front for a front of regulatory efforts. So he said. Uh, uh, so I, I'd like to <laughs> keep this situation. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tateishi. That was very helpful to have the images. Uh, appreciate your effort in, in you know, those bespoke images. And I think you raised some important points that we, we may get to discuss as we go on, looking at the various rights that are implicated and, and making sure that we do, um, you know, advance um, human rights and children's rights um, holistically and, and, you know, ensuring that every child has the right to protection from sexual abuse and exploitation. So from Japan, we're now going to move to Ghana and I'm so delighted to have uh, Dr. Albert Antwi Boasiako, who's the Director General of Ghana's Cyber Security Authority. So Director General, um, as the Cyber Security Authority really pioneers its role, because it Correct. is also relatively new in the scheme of things, Correct. Interested to hear how Ghana is championing industry responsibility and fostering innovation to tackle this issue of online child sexual abuse and exploitation. Uh, very well. Uh, Afro, thank you and uh, colleagues, um, speakers and uh, everybody here and hopefully also online. I think on behalf of my government, we're grateful uh, for the invitation to contribute to the discussion. But I was I want to I want to pick your statement, which for me that was my thesis statement. What you said, models of industry engagement for the protection. It just tells you that there is an existing one, and I'm impressed about how Australia has advanced that. But uh, as a government lead, for the past close to seven years, I think there are different maturity levels, and I want to speak from the developmental context. It's very important. First and first. Uh, if you jump uh, without doing the first things, likely to create problems. Uh, but I think that also I just pick your statement, Julie. Basic online safety expectations. I wrote that as well. Yeah, I did the commonality. You know, where, whether you are starting or uh, whether you advance, I think the baseline requirement are always key. But one also need to appreciate a bit of context developing country perspective sometimes my western colleagues tell me but you have this law especially when they come in i have a lot of international collaborators partners but the law is there but it seems nothing is working <laughs> sometimes it's not just about the technical competency or capacity of of uh, of the host country but uh, early part of this job, as a national advisor to government before I was appointed as director general, I realized that there are other factors that affect um, um, uh, enforcing certain legislation, especially when you are dealing with industry. And I've had a lot of conversations uh, at an international level, and earlier on in this job, when you, you, in fact, we run a lot of ideas with my partners, once you mention regulations, my Western colleagues will say no regulation, especially my US folks. But I think over the past few years, we've emerged to the middle. There is that sort of consensus that self-regulation alone cannot hurt, uh, keep our children safe. I think, by and large, uh, some of my colleagues have shifted a little bit. Possibly, I didn't also stay too extreme, <laughs> because, um, uh, there's that concern, if you over-regulate, then you are also going to kill innovation and others, especially a private sector perspective. But Ghana came up with a certain strategy, what we call collaborative regulation. 
is there regulation all right? Because we, without regulation, I don't think we'll be able to achieve it. But how? How unique is it? I realized that it's not just a government making a law and expect the industry to what? To comply. Sometimes, even understanding, and I can, I can confirm that, the industry that we expect to follow certain best practices, to implement certain measures, themselves do not appreciate the risks that our children are facing, either the content they access, the conduct themselves, or the content that they establish. When you have this realization, I think one will be very careful in terms of how you start uh, your, your regulatory process. So taking inspiration from uh, Julie, the basic sef online safety expectations, we had to pass the law. And the law incorporated the issue of blocking, taking down content, filtering. It was quite a difficult one because, of course, the suspicion from the civil society. Again, we had to sit together to uh, debate and eventually um, Section 87 of our uh, Cyber City Act make provisions to um, compel industry to act in a manner that will protect uh, children on the internet. But that is just a basic framework. I, I think my colleague from the common law country will appreciate that. The primary law is one, but you need the ally legislative instrument to also effectively and practically operationalize the law. And I think, Alfros, we're grateful. We had to invite you yourself. Um, uh, we, we open up, to not just industry, but international partners. Afro has to visit Ghana for the first time to take part in a public consultation to uh, formulate the specific mechanism by which uh, industry plays. And I think she saw that the industry is sitting together with us. In fact, they are suggesting. And as I said here, I can mention the Ghana's active, the first you know, active private sector player is the, the equivalent, the one who has the telecommunication chamber. Arguably, that is the most important <laughs> industry body with that. And they have been actively involved in terms of even developing the ally. That is what I refer to the collaborative regulation. Because if you're certain that we're doing this together, you, you lose the moral authority to say you are not complying. Of course, it doesn't mean that is the only two. Ghana's law incorporates sanctions, both administrative and, and uh, criminal sanctions. Of course, we needed to fund cybersecurity. And in the developing context, you don't just allow that. So we incorporated that. So if you do not comply, you are sanctioned. And telecommunication firms have got money. So you pay. And then we used to what? To finance cyber So we have these tools available in our law. But never, I mean, nonetheless, at the core, what I wanted to share as a model from our perspective is this collaborative approach that you engage with them because you need to build understanding. The, the concept of regulation in this age is not like in our context, you know, all these uh, headmaster and, and the student do go and do it. I think that's epoch is, is quite, uh, we need to engage. And I think it has been successful, even at governance level of my authority. 11 board members, three are from the industry. And I think that approach has worked. And uh, other international practices such as the guidelines for industry by the ITU, UNICEF, We Protect Framework have been incorporated into the ally uh, as a way of best practices. But currently what we're doing most is the intensifying the awareness creation. The ally is in the process because that is really what is going to operationalize the industry obligation and commitment. But we, I don't think I'll achieve much without really raising the awareness among the industry players that these are the risks. That's the reason why you need to comply if you need to take down a content. Uh, this is why you need to apply if you need to, I mean, you need to comply with the law if you need to block certain content as far as uh, the protection of children are concerned. So I think in a nutshell, ours is a developing situation, I must admit. Um, ours is a collaborative regulation because I think that is the best. It's not really a government just you know, giving instruction to industry, you know, it, it doesn't work like that. I think if you have a case, you discuss, you argue on the table. And I think that's what Ghana has been able to use to get the industry sitting at the table. And I think some of our international partners who visit see the discussions. It's open, transparent. There are risks. 
the government has to lead, industry you need to get on board. But I think we do that by way of talking. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Director General. No, that's really fascinating. And indeed, the purpose of this whole discussion is, is that exchange of experiences because there are very different approaches, different contexts, but what I really heard from you was going along that journey together with industry um, and looking at, you know, what was fit for purpose in, in your context um, and really moving from just what is on paper to practice and the best way to do that is bringing, bringing industry along, along with you. Um, now I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Dunstan Allison Hope, who's the Vice President uh, for Human Rights at BSR. Now, as I, as I mentioned just earlier, this, this issue of online child sexual abuse and exploitation, it's a human rights issue, it's a children's rights issue. And we do know that there are various tools in the human rights suite um, of tools, including human rights due diligence, including impact assessments, which are conducted by companies, and these can be key instruments in advancing responsible business conduct. So the question for you is, what does robust human rights due diligence entail, and how can it play a role in addressing this particular issue of online child sexual abuse and exploitation? Thanks. Please. Yeah. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak. Much appreciated. I'd love an invitation to Ghana as well, if that's, if that's <laughs> forthcoming. <laughs> um, that was quick. Um, so the um, main purpose of my comments today is to share how um, human rights due diligence, uh, based on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, can form an essential part of company efforts to respect child rights and to address online child sexual exploitation and abuse. I have really two main uh, thoughts to, to share. The first thought is around the value of human rights due diligence. And the second is about some regulatory trends that are going to uh, transform the landscape of human rights due diligence that I think it's important to, to think about. Um, so for context, the technology and human rights team at BSR has now conducted um, well over 100 different human rights assessments with technology companies. Uh, they come in a wide variety of different shapes and sizes. Uh, sometimes it's new products, sometimes it's content policy, sometimes it's market entry, market exit as well. Um, they come in lots of different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, and in doing those assessments, I think we've experienced three main benefits of taking the human rights-based approach that you've, you mentioned. Um, so the first is the systematic review of impacts across all international human rights instruments, including all rights in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So in a child rights context, that forces us to consider rights such as bodily security, uh, freedom of expression, privacy, uh, education, access to culture, non-discrimination. It forces us to consider all of these rights holistically and to consider the relationship between them. So these rights are interdependent. Uh, sometimes there's tension between them. Sometimes the fulfillment of one right enables the fulfillment of other rights. So one uh, clear benefit has been to uh, take that holistic approach. Um, the second is that a human rights-based approach requires us to give special consideration to those at greatest risk of becoming vulnerable, which clearly includes um, children. So this means that a robust human rights assessment would need to consider and find ways to consider the best interests of the child. Um, the third is that the UN Guiding Principles um, provides a framework for appropriate action to address uh, adverse human rights impacts. And one thing that we've really noted in the technology industry is that that appropriate action may vary considerably according to where in the technology stack uh, a company sits. So the UN Guiding Principles have been written for all companies, in all industries, um, in all countries of all sizes. They apply to everybody, but it forces us to think through how you apply them in the context of the company that you're um, working with. Now, till now, um, everything I've mentioned, all this human rights due diligence, has mainly been of a voluntary uh, activity by companies. Um, it is about to become much more mandatory with some very important um, implications. And this is my uh, second point, and I'm going to share a long list with you in slide form, too. Um, I started writing this long list, and I thought actually putting them on the slide might be, might be helpful. So there is a very long list of things that companies are now having to respond to. Um, we have the European Union Corporate 
sustainability due diligence directive that's going to require all companies doing business in Europe, so not just European companies, all companies doing business in Europe to undertake human rights due diligence. The uh, corporate sustainability reporting directive will require all companies doing business in Europe to report material topics informed by the outcome of human rights due diligence. And people often think of this as a reporting directive, which it is, but it has this really important line, informed by the outcome of human rights due diligence in it. And we've mentioned already the EU Digital Services Act that requires large online platforms and search engines to assess their impacts on fundamental rights, and it specifically calls out um, child rights as something to be assessed. We have the UK Online Safety Bill, which will require social media companies to assess content that may be uh, harmful or age inappropriate for children. We have the EU AI Act, which is still being debated as we speak, but essentially it includes the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights as the basis for understanding risk. Um, in Japan, we have the guidelines on respecting human rights and responsible supply chains. So if you put yourself in the shoes of a company, that's a lot to take on in one go. And what we've noted, what we advise uh, companies about, and what we talk to companies about a lot, is that the, throughout these regulations are human rights assessments that are human rights assessment requirements that are based on or very similar to the UN guiding principles of business and human rights. So our position has been, if you want to prepare yourself to comply not just with the letter of the, these laws, but the spirit of these laws, the outcomes that they're seeking to achieve, Taking an approach based on the UN guided principles is going to get you there and is going to get you to the right place with um, not just one of these regulations, but, but all of them. Um, my uh, point here is, is quite a simple one, which is that the rights of children, including efforts to address online sexual, um, child sexual exploitation and abuse, should be fully embedded into these broader methods of human rights due diligence. We need to make sure that um, assessment of risk to rights to, of children is fully embedded into these broader methods of human rights due diligence. So that could mean, for example, uh, child rights uh, impact assessments being a modular part of much broader human rights due diligence. It might mean making sure that children or those with insight into the best interests of the child being um, meaningfully consulted and included in the process to undertake um, human rights due diligence. There's lots that we can unpack there, um, but my advice is to in, in, sort of invest a lot of effort and thought into these um, processes. Um, so this trend towards mandatory human rights due diligence, I think is a, it's a massive regulatory and cultural shift for companies. Um, it's one that I think will be well advised to uh, harness for the child rights outcomes that we want to see. Um, I am reasonably optimistic on all this, with one caveat, which is you'll notice the European Union and the UK features very strongly on this list. And I do fear that so much time and attention goes towards the European Union and the United Kingdom that that takes time and attention away from places where human rights risks may be more prominent, may be more severe. So one uh, sort of flag that we're raising is to make sure that companies take global approaches while applying to these um, quite regional um, laws and regulations. I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Another very impressive effort of condensing a lot of information for us in that short time. Thank you, Dunstan. That was fantastic. Um, a lot of food for thought and really it's a timely discussion because of this global, you know, this massive shift in the in the global landscape, and also at the same time these massive um, child rights and child protection uh, challenges that we're facing. So, online participants and people in the room, we now um, do have a few moments for questions. We have a microphone um, behind us here, and we also have Josie um, monitoring the chat there. I'm not sure if there are any questions. Please, if you could come up to the mic and um, put your question. We can take a few and then we can open to the panel to discuss. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for this great uh, discussions and presentations. My name is Julia. I work for UNESCO and I would like to bring a kind of 
challenging topic um, and a rather provocative question. So we are talking here about protection and safety, which is, of course, the key of um, uh, existing of children online. But at the same time, um, we, are, we do consider the right of children to access to information. And it comes more pressing when we are talking about, for instance, sexuality education. So basically, it is easy to ban all the content on, uh, on sexuality online, but at the same time, there is a children, right, to get access to uh, uh, correct and scientific uh, information and content on sexuality. And I wonder um, what are your, I don't know, thoughts, ideas, how we might proceed with those, you know, challenging intersections between safety and access, uh, right to access this information. Thanks a lot. Yes. I might just take a couple of questions, so that just in the interest of time, and then um, really it will be open to the panel to answer. So please, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jutta Kroll from the German Digital Opportunities Foundation. Just to answer before I put my question, I would refer to the general command number 25 to the UN Convention the rights of the child. I've brought some copies for those who have not been come across that, and it will probably answer some of the questions that has been put. Uh, I have a question to the first speaker. I have to apologize that I came in a bit late, but what I heard on the uh, the new law and regulation was that it is also on raising awareness for parents and children in regard of protection on uh, with regard to see them there. And I wanted to know whether there is a relation between or a balance between, on the one hand, raising awareness and the education part, and on the other hand, the, the obligations to service providers. Uh, and then the second question is going to this colleague. Uh, I have seen you've been talking about DNS blocking, uh, but also we would need then removal of the content, not only blocking, because then it would still be there and probably uh, those who are looking for that content might find ways to circumvent the blocking that you've been talking about. Could you explain that maybe a little bit deeper? Thank you so much. Okay, it looks like we don't have any um, other questions from the floor for now. So there's three main uh, questions, if I can summarize it for our panel, and then we can just pass the mic along and if you would like to respond to one or all. So the first one is the, yeah, the really important um, balancing of the children's rights to access information and particularly sexual and reproductive um, health information and, and, you know, getting that balance right uh, when we're talking about um, harmful content and restricting access and making sure that that doesn't, you know, inadvertently restrict uh, children's other other rights. The second one, I think, may have been for our second speaker, the Japanese law. Yeah, so just understanding more about the awareness raising um, content. Um, and then the third one, which you've addressed it to the Japanese um, private sector, but perhaps other jurisdictions might like to share, you know, how they're making sure that it's not only about blocking, but also taking down and also responding you know safeguarding children as well so I think there is that whole that whole system so um, any volunteers from the from the panel Commissioner I was I was just saying earlier that um, clearly the internet was not built for children although one-third of the the users of the internet are children um, and their lo online lives are inextricably intertwined with their everyday lives. It's their schoolroom, it's their friendship circle, um, it's their place for learning, commuting, cre creating, um, and exploring, whether it's exploring their, their sexuality or affinity groups. Um, and we need to make sure that as we're trying to make this safer, that we're not, um, we're, we're mitigating the harms, but we're not, <laughs> we're harnessing the benefits as, as well. So, you know, we came up against this, um, we did a two year consultation on age verification, uh, which was probably one of the most uh, difficult processes I've, uh, I've gone through because there's just so much polar polarization. But one of the things that we were so conscious of w was the ability of, of marginalized communities to be able, and particularly young people, to be able to do that exploration and that that doesn't mean um, age verification doesn't mean restricting their access to everything. 
again, I think there are, are there are a lot of things that companies can do to um, beyond age gating, and I think Roblox is trialing some um, age verification. Um, Tinder just announced they're doing so in Australia, as is Instagram. So it's it's good to see that companies are starting to think about um, what is our responsibility to make sure that um, you know children are 13 and above and that we're doing making meaningful checks and I can say from our experience of youth-based cyberbullying what we saw post COVID is that because parents were so much more permissive with technology use when we were locked down we now have kids that are eight or nine reporting cyberbullying to us whereas um, prior to COVID the average age was about 14 so once you are permissive with technology use, you really cannot ratchet that 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 back. So I, I, w I would just say I'm, I'm the Australian regulator, and yes, we have powers, but we have a model where we talk about the three Ps of prevention, protection, and proactive and systemic change. You've got to prote you've got to prevent the harms from happening in the first place um, by having fundamental research um, by understanding how uh, how harms manifest against different vulnerable communities in di different ways and then co-designing solutions with those communities rather doing this with communities rather than two communities I, I think I heard um, Albert say and we struggle with this too one of the biggest challenges is raising awareness and encouraging young people to engage in help, help seek, seeking behaviors. And I, I'd say parents are the hardest cohort to reach. Um, so, so all of these things are interrelated. Um, if they weren't hard, then we would have nailed this already, but they are. So I just have a comment on the, I think it's the first question, maybe the second one. Um, so it's a great question because it, enables me to say that a human rights-based approach is designed to achieve um, precisely that. So a couple of things to say. First of all, when we do human rights assessments, it is quite typical for um, child sexual exploitation and abuse to raise to the surface as one of the most severe human rights risks that companies need to address. So first of all, that risk tends to come up as one of the top priority risks to address based on the criteria that UNGPs set out. Um, However, we do take this holistic approach. So we consider um, the relationship between different human rights. So when does the fulfillment of one human right enable the fulfillment of other rights? When does a um, violation of one right, like the violation of the right to privacy, present risks to other human rights, like the ability to access information or express yourself um, freely? Um, when there are tensions between rights, how do you address those tensions? Um, how do you apply human rights principles like um, legitimacy, necessity, proportionality, non-discrimination to decisions about when and how to restrict access to content? And just uh, one idea to, to throw out into the, the room that came to me when the question was asked. Um, one of the um, interesting developments in the sort of business and human rights field and the tech industry over the recent years has been the Meta Oversight Board where they publish case decisions on um, particular cases that come to the oversight board and make recommendations for what Meta should do to address um, the whatever failings they've identified. And I read a lot of those cases, and they're very long, and it includes a segment that undertakes a human rights analysis of that particular case. And the oversight board has the time and space to do that, because they're not making rapid decisions like Meta does. They, they have weeks and months to do this analysis. And I find it a really helpful source of insight. Um, I'm not sure that there have been many child rights related cases before the Oversight Board, but some place where we can do that type of thinking to unpack tensions between rights, the relationship between rights in a child rights context, I think would be really useful because we come across this all the time when we do human rights assessments, dilemmas, uncertainties. We're not sure what recommendations we should be making sometimes. Um, and I'd love space for that thinking to take place. Can I make a comment about it? I'm glad you're reading the cases of the Meta Oversight Board. Uh, it, it raises an interesting um, issue because there's a lot of discussion now about multi-stakeholder regulation of the platforms. And I believe that um, it, in the last transparency report, the Meta Oversight Board received about 1.3 million um, 
request to review decision, content moderation decisions that were made. And because these are such long, drawn out decisions, they were able to cover 12 in 12 months. Now, uh, I, I, I'd like to, we're a very small agency, but we've dealt with tens of thousands of investigations. And we're, you're just able to be a lot more nimble. So I think there's a really important role for that and to in kind of interrogate some of those more difficult ish and contextual issues. It's always the gray area that's going to be challenging. Um, but I, I'm not sure also how many of the decisions that the Meta has actually accepted based on oversight board recommendations, you might have a better sense. I'm just wondering if um, if you would like to respond to the question around the blocking and takedown. So first of all, we have to take down the so the, so many uh, times we uh, try to the and sometimes before all we are blocking that uh, we ask the other even the uh, foreign countries we ask there uh, there are sometime uh, police or any other governmental uh, offices we asked that. At last, uh, if we ask uh, them uh, if there is no reply or something, so uh, the last measure to block the, uh, some uh, sexual contents. Thank you. And I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Suzuki is still online because there was a question about um, just explaining more about the provision in the law about raising awareness, um, whether it, that's broad around all of children's rights in relation to the digital environment. Would Suzuki-san like to answer that question or we can? えっと、先ほど申し上げた通り、え、まずその、この日本の法律では、その子供のインターネットリテラシーに高めるという部分があります。そしてもう一つ、その、え、フィルタリングですね。要するにその、有害なものを子供たちがなるべく見ないようにする
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Suzuki, and thank you again to all our online and in-person participants. We have come to the end of our time together, though I think this is a topic that deserves a lot more time because, as was just mentioned, you know, there is a lot of complexity to this. There are, you know, very challenging dilemmas that regulators are dealing with, that companies are dealing with, that... Um, um, yeah, civil society that people working on these issues are, are dealing with. So it is something that I hope we can keep up the exchange. I hope that everyone found that a fruitful exercise, at least a start of the discussion. We're meant to capture key takeaways and key actions from each of the sessions. I don't know that they're fully formulated yet, but certainly um, I think I've taken away that there is this need to continue the learning and the exchange, that there is this need to ensure that these solutions are consultative, that everyone is involved in the journey, um, particularly companies when we're talking about um, regulation, co-regulation or collaborative regulation as Ghana is, is doing. Um, obviously, tech companies are vital stakeholders in this effort to protect children from online abuse, but we also see this massive global landscape shifting. I think I really took that away from your points, um, Dunstan, and just this opportunity to fully embed, you know, online protection of children from online um, sexual abuse and exploitation into these broader methods that are becoming increasingly ma um, mandatory. So thank you to our esteemed panellists. Um, the commissioner had to dash away to catch her Shinkansen to Tokyo, um, so she sends her apologies. But a huge thank you to our panellists, a huge thank you to our interpreters and everyone uh, supporting today. So thank you.